14 today. I'm just going to crank through till we finish the book of Mark with no more deviations, I hope. We'll see. Who laughed? <laughs> it's a pastor's privilege to go off on a tangent when he feels he needs to. I want to remind you this. This is a reminder that all of you can just corporately say, duh, too. But to live the Christian life is to live a life of faith. Believing the word of God for the things we do not see. We walk by faith and not by sight, wrote the Apostle Paul. And the writer of Hebrews says that now faith is confidence in what we hope for and assurance about what we do not see. And without faith, it is impossible to please God. Think about it like this. We trust in a God we cannot see. A Savior we cannot see, led by the Holy Spirit we've never seen. We hope in a resurrection that we will not see until we die, based on a guarantee that comes from forgiveness which we've never seen. It's all by faith. On occasion I will read this blog by a guy named The Friendly Atheist. And he wrote took a picture and he just thought it was so funny but he says the Bible makes sense when you make one correction and what he did is he crossed out the first four words of Genesis he crossed out those first four words and he wrote in or the first three words once upon a time God created the heavens and the earth and I think he does not know he wants to look at this Bible as a fairy tale, something that he doesn't have to believe in, so therefore he's not accountable, or so he thinks. But we know that this is not, and that this is the truth, and the very words of God. And all these things we don't see, we trust in regardless. All this is by faith. We are called to be people of faith, and at times God will cause us to exercise that faith in response to situations that are beyond our control when things Get out of control. And this is exactly what happened when Jesus' disciples were faced with a challenging problem that left them on, when he left them on their own for a short time. And how they were completely out of their element because they didn't act by faith. It's good to be reminded of who we are and what we are called to do, and that's to live by faith. Now, when we last left off, Peter, James, and John just had an awesome supernatural experience on Mount Hermon when Jesus was transfigured before their eyes. You remember he went up with those closest to him, and there Moses and Elijah appeared. They saw Jesus in his glory, and then they had to come down the mountain. After this wonderful spiritual experience, something reserved only for them, something that they were told they could not even talk about, then what happens? What happens when you come down off the mountain? What happens, Chris and family, when you go back to Alaska after this time of refreshing? We all know what happens when you come off the mountain, right? They come down the mountain to an entirely different scene. And this is what happened in Mark chapter 9, beginning at verse 14. When they came to the other disciples... They saw a large crowd around them, and the teachers of the law arguing with them. As soon as all the people saw Jesus, they were overwhelmed with wonder and ran to greet him. What are you arguing with them about, he asked. A man in the crowd answered, Teacher, I brought you my son who is possessed by a spirit that has robbed him of speech. Whenever it seizes him... It throws him to the ground, he foams at the mouth, gnashes his teeth, and becomes rigid. I asked your disciples to drive out the spirit, but they could not. You unbelieving generation, Jesus replied, how long shall I stay with you? How long shall I put up with you? Bring the boy to me. So they brought him. When the spirit saw Jesus, it immediately threw the boy into a convulsion. He fell to the ground and rolled around, foaming at the mouth. Jesus asked the boy's father, how long has he been like this? From childhood, he answered. It has often thrown him into fire or water to kill him. But if you can do anything, take pity on us and help us. If you can, said Jesus. 
Everything is possible for one who believes. Immediately the boy's father exclaimed, I do believe, help me overcome my unbelief. When Jesus saw that a crowd was running to the scene, he rebuked the impure spirit. You deaf and mute spirit, he said, I command you come out of him and never enter him again. The spirit shrieked, convulsed him violently and came out. The boy looked so much like a corpse that many said, he's dead. But Jesus took him by the hand and lifted him to his feet and he stood up. After Jesus had gone indoors, his disciples asked him privately, why couldn't we drive it out? He replied, this kind can come out only by prayer. It's an interesting account, not something you would expect after having such a wonderful experience with Jesus on the mountaintop. You'd think that after that mountaintop experience, all of them would be riding on a hallelujah, Holy Spirit high that they could bask in for just a little while. But for those of you who have walked with the Lord for any length of time, you know better than that. Expect that after a big spiritual experience, there will come a big spiritual test. And that's what happened here. Verses 14 and 15. When they came to the other disciples, they saw a large crowd around them and the teachers of the law arguing with them. As soon as all the people saw Jesus, they were overwhelmed with wonder and ran to greet him. They come down and they find the other nine disciples. What are they doing? Praying and conducting a Bible study with these people? No, they're arguing with the teachers of the law. What were they arguing about? Well, we aren't told specifically, but the rest of the passage gives us a hint. What are, what are you arguing with them about, he asked. A man in the crowd answered, teacher, I brought you my son who is possessed by a spirit that has robbed him of speech. Whenever it seizes him, it throws him to the ground. He foams at the mouth, gnashes his teeth, and becomes rigid. I asked your disciples to drive out the spirit, but they could not. Can you imagine what this argument may have been about? Jesus isn't there. The disciples are, and their man comes with this son. And we have the religious leaders who are always checking up on what Jesus' disciples are doing. They are trying to cast out the demons out of this son, and they can't do it. So you can imagine the religious leaders, ah, you don't have any power. You're following this guy, Jesus, who says you have power. You don't have any power. Yes, we do. Watch this. Come out. Come out of him. Does nothing happens. They laugh at him. They mock him. The rest of the crowd, perhaps they're laughing and mocking too. So they start arguing with the crowd, with the religious leaders. We don't know for certain. But it's easy to get in the flesh, isn't it? It's easy to get in the flesh and forget that we're representing Jesus. And what a contrast to the wonderful experience they enjoyed previously, huh? When they were with Jesus on the mountaintop. When they were communing with the Lord and Moses and Elijah. Look at the contrast. The transfiguration was on a mountain. Now they're in a valley. At the transfiguration, they experienced Christ's glory. Now they see human suffering. At the transfiguration, God was the focus. Now Satan is. At the transfiguration, the heavenly father was pleased. Now a human father is tormented. At the transfiguration, the disciples were the, with the perfect son. Now they're with a perverted son. At the transfiguration, they experienced holy awe. Now they experience unholy horror. And isn't that the Christian life, though? One day it's heaven and the next is hell. One moment it's a spiritual high and the next is an exhausted sigh. We see in this situation the significance of faith. This is what it's about. This father was desperate. In the King James Version, he calls his son a lunatic. Other versions say he had seizures and he suffered terribly. The father could not help his poor son. And the disciples had failed. His only hope was Jesus. And it's in these desperate times that faith is significant. We've all been there, haven't we? We've called our friends and family, but they couldn't help. The doctors didn't do anything. The medication doesn't work. And all you're left with is just Jesus and you. That's all you have. Doesn't matter how many books you've read. Doesn't matter the devotionals. All it's about is you and Jesus when it comes down to it. It's in times like these that you have to rely entirely on the Lord alone and no one else. 
You must exercise that faith muscle that, by the way, that faith muscle gets exercised every time you have little issues that come into your life, inconveniences, troubles, problems. They're like little workouts, right? I've started working out again in our gym, and I'm telling you, I've lost a lot of, well, you never knew I had any muscles, but I've had to start out with really light weights again. I have to start them out. And I've got to work my way up to bigger weights and bigger weights. And one day I'll be able to bench as much as Bill can. The guy's 75 and he benches like 280 pounds. Okay. But it starts. The little problems and troubles we experience are like little workouts that get us ready for the bigger ones. Now's the time you must really trust Jesus and find out that his promises are true. Yet sometimes there's a shortage of faith. Verse 19. You unbelieving generation, Jesus replied. How long shall I stay with you? How long shall I put up with you? Bring the boy to me. This is a harsh rebuke. Jesus is frustrated at everyone because no one believes. The religious leaders certainly didn't. The crowds didn't. The distressed father didn't have any faith. But those who should have been leading the crowd, the disciples... Those who had been with Jesus the past two years, of all people, they should have had enough faith to perform the miracle necessary to deliver the boy. Can you see the irony of this? These people, these disciples are with Jesus. Why were the disciples so powerless? When Jesus sent them all out two by two, they cast out many demons and anointed with oil many who were sick and healed them. What happened now? I have a bigger question. I have a bigger question. Why are we so powerless? How come we don't see people getting healed? Or masses coming to Jesus in repentance and faith? We can look at these disciples and go, why didn't they? Well, what about us? How often do we hear of an unbeliever in need, some problem in the family, some illness, and we shake our head in sympathy instead of praying a believing prayer right there on the spot? How often do we hear the blasphemy spoken by unbelievers, the crazy notions of what they think about God, yet we say nothing, we explain nothing, we preach nothing. We've been with Jesus. We've seen what he's done in our lives, haven't we? We're saved by faith because of what we heard from someone else's lips. How can we remain quiet? Why do we remain so passive when so many are struggling and dying without hope and without Jesus? Our country is indicative of where we are at in our Christian faith. A country so divided. Keith Green sang these words in a famous song called Asleep in the Light, and it haunts me. He's saying, do you see, do you see all the people sinking down? Don't you care, don't you care? Are you going to let them drown? How can you be so numb not to care if they come? You close your eyes and pretend the job is done. Open up, open up and give yourself away. You see the need, you hear the cries. So how can you delay? He's talking to us. This was a rebuke then to the church in the 70s. And then another band called Casting Crowns wrote this song, maybe about... Eight years ago? It's called If We Are the Body. They say, but if we are the body, why if we are the body, why aren't his arms reaching? Why aren't his hands healing? Why aren't his words teaching? And if we are the body, why aren't his feet going? Why is his love not showing them there is a way? There is a way. There is a way. That's a contemporary song for us today. This is our job. Because the disciples did not act by faith in the power Jesus gave them, they lost faith with the leaders, the crowds, and certainly this father of the poor demonized son. Which brings us to the source of our faith. Verses 20 and 23. So they brought him. They brought him. They brought the son. When the spirit saw Jesus, it immediately threw the boy into a convulsion. He fell to the ground and rolled around, foaming at the mouth. Jesus asked the boy's father, how long has he been like this? From childhood, he answered. 
and it has often thrown him into fire or water to kill him. But if you can do anything, take pity on us and help us. If you can, said Jesus, everything is possible for one who believes. The father had heard about Jesus, so he goes directly to the source. He didn't read books about Jesus. He didn't watch movies about Jesus. He didn't go to the healing spectacle in San Antonio, nor did he go to the mega church in Houston. No, he went straight to the source. And how often do we go everywhere else for the answers when the answer has always been with us? Jesus. Jesus. If you can, said Jesus, if you can, Everything is possible for one who believes. Do you hear the incredulousness of Jesus' reply? Don't you know who I am? Don't you know what I can do? He says that to us today. You know that. He's saying that to us today. This is the living word. Do you not know what he can do? Do you not know what he can do? Do you? Do you believe that Jesus can heal? That Jesus can save. That Jesus can do what you ask. He can. He can. He can. He can. Do you take everything to him? Do you trust him with your difficult life situation, whatever that may be? To act in faith is to ask Jesus to trust Jesus, to rely solely on Jesus. That's why I love your prayer books. The prayer books that, you're, that everyone in the nation is going to have someday because it's all about asking Jesus. There's no frills. Doesn't even come with a DVD, does it? Just a prayer book. You pray to Jesus. This is the simplicity of faith, y'all. In response to Jesus' incredulous question, if you can, everything is possible for one who believes, he says. Immediately the boy's father exclaimed, this is the best prayer in the Bible besides have mercy on me, a sinner. This is the best prayer in the Bible. I do believe. Help me overcome my unbelief. That's it. We all believe, but we have inside of us this disease of unbelief, don't we? Will he really? Is he going to do anything? I haven't seen him work. We forget about the daily miracles, like we ate, and we get to sleep well, some of us. We get to stay in a nice place. We have a wonderful church with air conditioning. This is one honest prayer. Yes, Lord, I know who you are, but help me overcome me. <laughs> Help me overcome me. It's a simple prayer. We believe, but inside we doubt. We struggle. Will God come through? You know what? We don't know if he will, but we pray as if he will. Why should we pray an unbelieving prayer? We're praying for your brother. We're praying for your mother. We're praying for your father. We're going to pray for Beverly. Beverly never leaves the service. She left sick. We're praying for the people going to Young Life on their camp trip to Colorado and praying, I am praying that those kids, those knucklehead teens would get a dose of the Holy Spirit. That they would come back saved and revived and bring them here, bring them to other churches so that they can be the generation that brings back Jesus. Because we have a whole generation that are completely lost. This is why we have been investing in young life. This is why we have been investing, because we don't have a youth group here now, we're going to invest where their youth can grow and then go into churches. This is why we're going to continue to pray for Chris and your family when you go back to Alaska, because you're facing the same stuff here. I don't think it's just here. It's everywhere. It's a, the greatest disease ever to hit America is the disease of unbelief. But he can. He can. I do believe. Help me overcome my unbelief. And Jesus did come through, didn't he? This is the sureness of faith. 
verses 25 to 27, when Jesus saw that a crowd was running to the scene, he rebuked the impure spirit. You deaf and mute spirit, he said, I command you, come out of him and never enter him again. The spirit shrieked, convulsed him violently, and came out. The boy looked so much like a corpse that many said he's dead, but Jesus took him by the hand and lifted him to his feet, and he stood up. I met with my friend Amalio on um, Friday night for a couple of hours, and he has a, he, this kind of a healing ministry. He believes that he's called to, to cast demons out of people, and while I... I got fed up with that when I was a brand new Christian because demons will play with you. I believe if you repent and trust in Jesus that you're free, but it's okay. And he had videos of people he's praying for, and okay, I don't know how that all works. But did demons stop possessing people when Jesus left the earth? No, we just call it something else, right? We call it something else. Some of you may be called to pray that kind of prayer that someone be delivered. I like just saying, you need to repent and put your trust in Jesus. If they say no, they walk away with that demon. Or they can say, I repent and trust in Jesus and that demon is gone. Because greater is he who is in you than he who is in the world. You can be oppressed by demons. You can be oppressed. They can get you down. They can distract you, but they can't inhabit you. But nevertheless, if we pray by faith for some of these people, let's see what God would do, what kind of deliverance would come. This father had barely enough faith, but he had just enough. And Jesus acted. Hey, let me tell you this. Weak faith is better than no faith at all, okay? The disciples apparently had too little, though, because after all of this happened... After Jesus had gone indoors, his disciples asked him privately, why couldn't we drive it out? He replied, this kind can come out only by prayer. And in the um, older manuscripts, they don't have with fasting. But I think prayer and fasting are both good things to do. I'm going to tell you a story. I forgot to ask Laurel for permission, but this happened 10 years ago. Do you mind? Do you remember? You don't remember? You do remember? You don't want me to say? I can I can't. Okay. We had to fast and pray for something, and deliver, Laurel got delivered. <clears throat> Not nearly as good as the gory details, but I forgot to ask, so I'll honor that. But prayer and fasting works. Prayer and fasting works because God works and honors our commitment and our self-denial. Why couldn't we drive it out, the disciples asked Jesus. In the parallel passage in Matthew, Jesus gave the real answer to the disciples. He replied, because you have so little faith, Truly I tell you, if you have faith as small as a mustard seed, you can say to this mountain, move from here to there, and it will move. Nothing will be impossible for you. The implication is that the disciples didn't even have a mustard seed of faith, and that was the smallest seed in Palestine. And how long had they been with Jesus and they still didn't have much faith? Also, since he told them they needed to pray, they may have tried to cast this demon by, out by their own power, in their own strength. It's easy for us to go, hey, I can do this. I can go, be healed in the name of Jesus, and have everyone watching us. Hey, put on your phone right now. Get this, get this. I thought it was kind of funny how, never mind. I think it, that we want to be focused on who Jesus is and what he can do, and it doesn't matter if you record it for YouTube Right? Because there are people with real problems who probably don't want to have a hundred likes when their demon gets cast out. <laughs> they probably relied on their own strength. I like what one commentary said about this incident. Why had the nine disciples failed? Because they had been careless in their personal spiritual walk and had neglected prayer and fasting. The authority that Jesus had given them was effective only if exercised by faith. But faith must be cultivated through spiritual discipline and devotion. I can, I can say this with 100% certainty. If you don't have time with the Lord, if you aren't reading his word, if you aren't spending time in prayer with him, you will have no power. I can guarantee you that if you're not spending time with him, if you're not reading his word, you're not going to want to go out there and stand for him because you don't really know him. You don't know what he can do. 
The commentary continues, it may be that the absence of their Lord or his taking the three disciples with him and leaving them behind had dampened their spiritual fervor and diminished their faith. Not only did their failure embarrass them, but it also robbed the Lord of glory and gave the enemy opportunity to criticize. It is our faith in Jesus that glorifies God. It is our faith in Jesus that glorifies God. The contrast is between a man who never walked with Jesus, but had enough faith to see his son healed. And those who did walk with Jesus and saw his power and his miracles, what he did and what he could do, but they didn't have enough faith. So do you have enough faith to believe God for the impossible and the improbable? If you don't, if you don't, pray this simple, powerful, and honest prayer. I do believe. Help me overcome my unbelief. Let's pray that now.